Okay, without any further ado, we have Joe Nagus is going to be join it, joining us. Uh, he's made a video recording. I'm gonna, I see I've got him kind of got this kind of convoluted up here, but. Hi here, everybody, Joe Nagus here. here. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And so great to be able to speak to you on such an important topic, one that I am deeply passionate about, not only as a legislator, but as a father and as a citizen as well. It is no secret that the impacts of the climate crisis are at our doorstep, that climate change is here now, that it is happening today in our communities. In the last year alone, our communities have witnessed record setting and catastrophic wildfires, fatal flash floods, and the worst air quality in the world. Let me repeat, the worst air quality in the world. We can't afford to wait any longer for bold, urgent action on climate change. As many of you know, I have a young daughter. She just turned three. She doesn't yet understand the scale of these crises or the profound impact that humans will have on our environment. But she does understand the beauty of Colorado's outdoor places, of clean air, of clean water. We must ensure that the next generation, my daughter's generation, is not left with a world of frequent natural disasters and untenable air quality. So the question becomes, how do we do it? Well. One solution that I believe will have a tremendously positive impact is the 21st Century Climate Conservation Corps. Our plan would put hundreds of thousands of people to work, restoring our lands and communities and tackling the climate crisis. It is a bold proposal to meet the confluence of challenges that our communities are experiencing. Western droughts, flash floods, wildfires, and the existential threat of climate change. We're taking a page, really, out of FDR's playbook. We want to reimagine the conservation core of the 1930s, which literally built red rocks, roads, trails, and campgrounds in Rocky Mountain National Park, countless other projects throughout our state and throughout our country. We want to make major investments in community resilience to protect watersheds, to mitigate future flooding, to restore our forests, and help suppress wildfires and more. This proposal will meet our communities where they are and provide the people and funds to complete these important projects. It really is a once in a generation investment in our forests and in a new diverse workforce to prepare us for the future. The original Triple C, as some of you may know, employed 3 million Americans across the country, building parks, building trails, fighting wildfires, restoring farmland. It's worked before and it can work again. We have the opportunity to create good paying jobs, build a diverse workforce and strengthen career pathways by making bold investments in clean energy and in climate resiliency in our public lands. As many of you know, we've been working closely with President Biden and the committee chairs in the House and the Senate to ensure that the $3.5 trillion Build Back Better plan that we are poised to pass this fall will move us towards a clean energy future. President Biden's Build Back Better plan is a critical step, again, in making a once in a generation investment in our climate by establishing, for example, an energy efficiency and clean energy standard, the first time in the history of the federal government, and expanding and extending clean energy and electric vehicle tax credits. The bottom line is this, we cannot wait another month, another year, another decade to put people to work in stopping the climate crisis, and our kids can't either. It's time to pass a bold policy that will build a nation powered by clean energy, creating millions of good paying jobs and tackling climate change at the same time. Luckily, with the Build Back Better agenda being crafted in congressional committees as we speak, we have an opportunity in the next eight weeks to pass the most transformational wide reaching climate action legislation in a decade. We have to get it done. And I am so proud to represent a district and a state with such dedication to getting it done, to ultimately solving this crisis through action. And I'm very grateful for the role that each and every one of you are playing to engage and educate yourselves around these issues and to move the needle forward one step at a time. Please know that my offices are always open to your calls and to hear your ideas, your suggestions, your proposals, to work in partnership with you to solve this problem. I'm here to represent you and your values and I want to hear your solutions. So thank you again for having me. And thank you so much to the Longmont Climate Committee for organizing a wonderful event. I look forward to seeing you all in person very soon. Take care.
Okay. If I can get this done, being the techie that I am here. Thank you so much to Joe. Our, I didn't introduce him properly. He is our second congressional district representative in the US Congress. So um, that was great to hear from him. Next up, we have a panel of our local legislators and uh, we have uh, uh, Representative Karen McCormick, Colorado State Senator Sonia Jaquez Lewis and State House Representative Tracy Burnett. So they're gonna speak on a, speak to you uh, on, the, on a panel. And first up is Karen McCormick. So thank you for coming, Karen. Uh, let me see, I think I have to, I'm gonna pull up your, let's see here. I'm gonna share my screen again. No, you're gonna pull up your own, right? Okay. No, you're gonna I don't, I, it's all, it's me. Mm -hmm. so. okay. okay, you're good, yeah. we're good to go. All right, thank you. So, it is the me show, you get to look at me and not slide. So I apologize okay. for that. It's fine, we're glad to have you. Yeah, well, thank you for um, keeping me in the loop and um, inviting me to this. I really do appreciate it. And uh, good to see so many people that are on this, this call. Um, and sorry, I missed the other one. Uh, I wanted to give an update on some of the things I have been working on and maybe just a little forecast for the future. I feel uh, so fortunate that um, similarly to Representative Burnett, we had our very first legislative session last um, January through June and really didn't have the ramp up time before that January, we kind of had a month <laughs> to get ready. So having this six, four to six month period of um, time has been such a gift and um, just been able to explore so many different things. So as far as um, what I'm looking to bring forward this next legislative session. A lot of it is still in the works, of course, because we're in the midst of it. In fact, I just had uh, another meeting with folks at the Colorado Energy Office today, specifically in regards to the greenhouse gas reduction roadmap, um, and know that there's another kind of updated version of that coming out soon with um, New, new, not necessarily new targets, but new ideas on how to reach those targets. And so I'm in constant communication with them um, and they will have some legislative priorities that will come um, later in October that I will be um, circled in with and hopefully be helpful to, to get our state uh, on this just hurry up on this, this roadmap. Um, the, the, the goals that we have set forth to um, significantly reduce these emissions um, under HB 1912 or 261, um, the 26% reduction by 2025 and 50% reduction by 2030. Um, and then really going forward to make sure we meet that challenging 90% reduction by 2050. Um, the, the more I learn, the more I learn that this is an all of the above approach, kind of similar to what Representative Nagoose uh, outlined a little bit. We have to do everything in every sector um, all the time. Um, it's that urgent. And we know that uh, the majority of our emissions come from the transportation sector and, and the production of electricity sector. And the production of electricity sector certainly has um, a, a more straightforward path, I guess, to um, implement those reductions. Whereas the transportation sector, there's so many of us involved, like all these individuals, all these vehicles, uh, it's, it's a, it's a large issue, but it's also a little more complicated because so much is involved. And um, to achieve that lower grid, that lower carbon um, grid and, and working on electrifying, not only um, state trucks, uh, small, vehicle, small um, lightweight trucks and vehicles um, that are personally owned, 
uh, what came to my, came to my interest um, this this summer was those working on getting our uh, getting forth a proposal to mandate that our state any um, diesel trucks diesel vehicles in our state um, have to go to a biodiesel blend um, and finding out the difference in what gets put into our air from straight petroleum diesel versus biodiesel um, is truly impactful. And um, I'm like I said at the beginning, I'm still exploring this, but uh, this is a way for us to, our goal is to electrify the transportation sector completely. Um, and the kind of the, the, ramp to get there, you know, it is longer than I want it to be. And so meanwhile, what else can we do? And this is a great kind of bridge. What else can we do to lower those emissions now to help um, get these um, volatile organic compounds out of the air? Um, this is something that we can do in the near term as we get to more and more electrification of our transportation sector. Just to give you an idea of the carbon intensity score of uh, these two products, petroleum diesel has a carbon intensity score of 102, whereas biodiesel is down at 26. Um, the other great thing to, so biodiesel and biomass diesel products can reduce these emissions, greenhouse gas by 86% and has reduced emissions by over 27 million metric tons in California, just in the last 10 years. Um, and in one year alone, almost 7 million metric tons. So it's really been a proven way to um, on, your, on your way to electrification, do this now. And the reason it needs to be mandated is that um, if it is, especially on the um, non-attainment zones in our state, so Denver, kind of where we live, these non-attainment zones to really help those communities that are impacted the, the greatest. Um, it also can help us reduce our methane um, production how am I doing on time? Um, yeah, I think you're probably at the end of the time, Karen. Okay, anyway, it'll also reduce methane because so much of this can be produced, um, made from waste fats, cooking oil, animal tallow, crop residues, all those things by a tremendous amount. So not only are we getting um, carbon out of the air, we're reducing um, methane in our air as well. So. Looking forward to sharing more as I get further down the road. Well, thank you so much for all that you do. I'm really glad to have you as our legislator and we're looking forward to the next year to see how everything, what it all happens. So thank you so much. Uh, next up is uh, Senator Sonia Jaquez Lewis representing the, our 17th district. Hi, Lynette. Yes, how are you? District 17, love it. That's the L Town, Longmont, Louisville, Lafayette. Um, just a super shout out to you and Karen and the whole team and some of my favorite folks. Exactly. Uh, Ken Wilson, Nancy York, Gaithier Weiss, uh, Joan Peck, uh, Susie Hidalgo. I love all of y'all. So, a quick shout out to you. I'm super honored that you. Uh, invited me to be a part of this and my excuse me for my background I am uh, in the middle of a very huge healthcare uh, policy conference and so they I have my background saved because I'm presenting every day at that large conference we couldn't do it in person this year uh, but anyway I'm very honored to talk about what we've been doing uh, to affect climate change and where I see us going um, as those of you, many of you already know this, but climate change really affects our BIPOC community uh, in some ways much more uh, than uh, uh, other, other folks. And as a member of the Latinx caucus at the Capitol, I'm so proud to work with our caucus because we have done specific bills to address the impact of climate change and poor air quality on our communities of color in Colorado. We have some new data 
about that. So, um, and this was just reported. I'm happy to put, put a reference up if you don't know about it, haven't heard about it, but it's reported from uh, Christy Richardson at CDPHE, our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, uh, of the eight uh, state-run air quality monitors um, we have 92 days out of 242 days this year are uh, communities of color. I'm mostly talking about Globeville, uh, talking about Elaria Swans Swansville, and um, uh, around National Jewish, uh, that out of 92 out of 242 days, it was the worst pollution um, ever in those communities. And in April 2021, 29 days out of 30 days of the month surpassed all other areas of the state for the highest fine particle pollution. So what CDPHE, because of bills that we ha are, have done and funding that we have given them, is they are going to be doing more community air monitoring so that we can hold these polluters, and we all know that Suncor is one of the worst, uh, accountable. We've now attached, because of several legislative bills that we've run in the last three years, uh, and, and three years is about the time when our Latinx caucus really started getting into gear on these environmental issues, we've been able to institute much higher uh, air pollution fines. Um, and, and let me put a fine point on this with the fine particles is the impact when you think about what's happening with us in COVID, the, it, it, the whole situation is really uh, exacerbated. And what happens is the fine particles, those of you that are healthcare professionals already know this, but the fine particles go deep into the lung and cause the asthma and cause uh, the exacerbations of COPD and cardiac complications. And the kicker is that these areas where we see more pollution, what do we see? We see higher rates of COVID hospitalizations. Uh, so as an example, in these um, higher pollution areas, you have 13.4 hospitalizations per thousand people compared to Wash Park, where there's only 1.4 hospitalizations per thousand people. If anybody's you know, really interested in more of that, that information, I can totally uh, give you the links. Where I see us going is more holding polluters more accountable. I think we'll see more bills around that. Uh, I was the house sponsor of the biodiesel bill that uh, Karen previously mentioned. We had to put that on hold because of COVID. I do see it coming back because we'd like to see a bridge between uh, for trucks between uh, fossil fuel until we can get more electric. Um, so I see us doing a lot more work. Uh, this is not, you know, this is a climate crisis and everyone, all the representatives from Boulder County know this and we have our numbers who agree with us are growing at the Capitol. We had Republican support on some of these bills and I think that that will continue to grow. So I'll stop there. I don't wanna take up too much time and uh, keep it, keeping us on track, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone wants to put in the chat. And thank you very much for inviting me and thinking of me. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for your information and thank you for all you do. We're just so happy that you are our Senator. So thank you so much. It's really nice to have you. Uh, next up is uh, Colorado State House of Representative Tracy Burnett representing the 12th district. My thing cut off. You, you got yeah. it, you got it. Okay. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna share my screen and put your PowerPoint up. So let me- Okay, thank you. That. And I, I'm just gonna start. Uh, thank you all for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here and talking with you. And I'm just gonna say it has been an absolute banner year for um, environmental legislation, especially climate change legislation. So if you can just move to the next slide, I'm gonna quickly go through the, the bills that I was involved in this year. Uh, the first one, House Bill 1238. This is basically a gas energy efficiency bill for buildings. And it, uh, you know, natural gas 
is methane, a very powerful greenhouse gas. And so this bill is expected to reduce um, the um, CO2 uh, you know, uh, equivalent of 800,000 tons over the next 10 years and save Colorado less residents six to $700 million in gas utility costs. There's also provision to help um, income qualified residents with their weatherization. So they are, they are burning less natural gas and they are saving money. And also what's really um, groundbreaking about this bill is that it factors in the long-term impacts of climate change for generations in such a way that it really fosters our um, residents and businesses to transition to clean heat technologies even faster. It's a fabulous bill. Um, the next one is uh, House Bill 1303. Actually, I presented it New York Climate Week yesterday because this is a groundbreaking first in the nation bill of its kind in terms of the scope. And what I, I just put it in, um, you know, why do we care about things like green construction materials? Well, if concrete and steel, concrete and steel represent 14% of total greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, and the cement, which is that glue in concrete, were a nation, it would be the third largest uh, emitter in the country, in the world, I'm sorry, the third largest, largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So we really do care about greening up our construction materials. So what this, this bill does, it directs the uh, state architect and the um, Department of Transportation to use greener construction materials in their state funded buildings and transportation projects. But along the way, it reduces not only greenhouse gas emissions that are used to produce these materials, it reduces air pollution right here in Colorado. It fosters recycling, it fosters using green energy, and it also, um, you can, um, it, it fosters carbon sequestration. You can reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions used to create these materials by 30 or 50 30 to 50 percent with no cost impact it's a huge opportunity for us to really make a dent in um, in meeting our greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, reduction goals um, my next bill very quickly house bill 1009 is uh, basically um, uh, providing uh, energy efficiency loans and grants for low and moderate income housing, affordable, affordable housing developments um, by improving their you know, energy efficiency and also reducing the transportation costs um, for those, um, the, for the people who can least afford to spend money and uh, in time and transportation. If you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, these are the other bills that I was involved in this year. Um, SB 272 funds a lot of the Public Utility Commission's work on many, many environmental bills. And, I did, and it also has a, some wonderful language about really driving um, equitable investments in disproportionately impacted communities. That's something that Senator Hawkins Lewis talked about. And I just gotta call out one thing. Many people have heard about um, uh, Senator Winter's uh, Senate Bill 200 and gosh, what happened to that? Well, one of the bills that this bill funds is House Bill 1266, that's the disproportionately impacted communities. It took care of three of the five sectors we're going after in um, Senate Bill 200. So we got a lot done in that area. Um, my next bill, um, Senate Bill 230, it provides $40 million of stimulus money to finance a green bank. And this is, this is a green bank that basically re leverages um, public to private um, dollars five to 10 times, all for renewable energy projects. There's also stimulus money for residents and commercial uh, buildings to um, uh, get low cost energy efficiency loans, as well as uh, help with EV charging stations. My next bill, uh, 26, uh, Senate Bill 264, first in the nation, first in the nation, clean heat plans for all Colorado utilities. And what this does is that all Colorado utilities must measure the greenhouse gas emissions associated with their building customers and 
reduce those greenhouse gas emissions by 22% by 2030. This is a, just a phenomenal bill. And I'm so hard to be part of it. This is also part of um, SB 200's bill. This is like going after the fourth of the five sectors that um, SB 200 was trying to was was going after. And finally, I'm just going to mention that um, uh, uh, Senator Caucus Lewis and Representative McCormick and I also did uh, Senate Bill 235, which helps with um, agri um, renewable energy and ag efficiency programs for um, agriculture, or, you know, ranchers and farmers. And then finally, um, my bill, um, or a bill, Senate Bill 108, was not only a pipeline safety bill, but it also uh, required reductions in methane leaks. Another green, of course, another greenhouse gas, <laughs> powerful greenhouse gas emitter. So next, okay, so now next X, this is stuff you're really interested. You know, this is, this is a kind of a slide of where our greenhouse gas emissions like uh, by sector look right now. And I'm just going to give you a little peek into things that I'm working really hard on right now. Um, air quality. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this is near and dear to my heart because my son nearly died of an asthma attack when he was a toddler. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we passed a lot of good, great legislation in air quality a couple of years ago. And I am, uh, want to build on that progress. And I am talking to a lot of scientists and policy experts to identify best approaches, best approaches in addressing our horrific, worst in the nation air quality, both in the short term and in the long term. I'm also continuing to work on, on building buildings in terms of um, reducing and eliminating our, our dependence on fossil fuels used to heat our buildings. And uh, I'd have to say buildings is the hardest nut to crack. It's gonna take the longest to decarbonize. And so I, I'm, I'm continuing to look at ideas in that area. Also agriculture, this is an area, you know, you know we do have, there's things like uh, methane emissions from uh, agriculture. And also I'm very interested in carbon sequestration. And then finally, but not least of all, grid resiliency. When you look at our wildfires, the floods we've had and what has happened around the nation, this is exceptionally important. And I have been learning that the most resilient and cost-effective grid is one that's combining utility, scale, renewable energy with microgrids. So that's all I'm gonna say on that. And uh, final slide. You guys asked, what can you do to move us on this path to, uh, you know, zero emissions future? And I just want to put something in your head. I learned this summer, 50% of the path forward to net carbon emissions is energy efficiency. So these are the things you can do and start considering. First, Reduce or eliminate your methane, i.e. your natural gas usage in your homes by weatherizing, by managing your demand by smart thermostats and smart appliances, use more efficient gas appliances, and uh, ideally think about um, uh, switching from your gas cooktop to an induction stove. And also uh, think about the, you know, if your, your air conditioner is getting kind of old, think about uh, heat pumps because heat pumps can both heat and cool your house. And also if you're going through a remodeling or you're building a new home, pre-wire that home for electric vehicles and heat pump technology. The other thing you can do is reduce and eliminate your oil, you know, your, the gas you use to power your vehicle by using a more gas efficient car. And of course, you know, look at buying a new or used electric vehicle. And I just wanna leave you with one thought. I figured out that my electric vehicle, which I drive about 10,000 miles a year, I, I'm almost up on a year right now, it, the quote unquote fuel costs of that car is $100 a year. I can drive that car 10,000 miles on $100 a year just by being smart, uh, by it being an electric vehicle because they're much more efficient about how they use um, um, uh, you know, the um, energy, but also because I charge it in off time. So my final thing I'd just like to say is, is you, what you can do, advocate and educate yourself. 
educate yourself on how you can do things better and advocate to your community members, your elected officials, your utilities. So I hope I haven't gone over too much, but I had a lot to say. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, I know we're, we're, we've got good time right now. So you, you did great. We have plenty of time. Thank you so much for, for um, yeah, all that great information. And we're going to borrow some of your ideas that you had and put it on our um, on our, our little, we have a little sheet we're gonna hand out to everyone. We're gonna send it out to everyone who uh, registered. So we'll, we'll take some of your ideas because we were gonna put some of those ideas on anyway. So thank you so much and thank you for all you do. And uh, last year was a fantastic year for all of you. And I hope this next year is even better. So I'm excited to see what next year is gonna bring for you. Uh, okay, I'm going to um, turn this over now to uh, Mitzi. Nicoletti, and she's going to introduce Andrew. So go ahead, Mitzi. Thank you, Lynette. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Andrew Closer with the Colorado Field Advocate with Earthworks. Andrew is very passionate about environmental justice and community organizing. He's determined to apply his passion to the critical work here in Colorado to ensure that the state and local governments prioritize public health, the environment, and of course, our future. I got to meet up with Andrew a week and a half ago and at a homeowner's house that lives just a few hundred feet from the Night Well, which is located at Union Reservoir here in Longmont. And I was able to witness Andrew at his work and at the same time, experience what it's like for someone to live only a few hundred feet from a fracking site. And I will say in less than 30 minutes, all of us started getting a headache. So right now, Andrew is going to share some of the images from several of his visits. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. One second, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen. There we go. All right. So as thank you, Mitzi. And as Mitzi said, my name is Andrew Kloster. I'm the Colorado Field Advocate with Earthworks. Um, I think at this point, you're all pretty familiar with my face if you've been tuning into these webinars because I've been providing periodic updates on our field work around Longmont um, oil and gas pollution that we've been observing over the last couple of months. Um, with, uh, I think, pretty specific focus on the Cub Creek night pad, as Mitch, Mitzi mentioned. Um, I think it's kind of at the top of everyone's mind in that area right now. Um, they are, should be wrapping up their completions, their fracking phase um, relatively soon. Um, they, it's been going on since late July, early August. And on the last webinar, if you tuned in, I sort of made a promise that I would definitely go out and look at the site and come back on this webinar and share the visuals with you all. So I have visuals to share. Um, one thing I will just quickly preface, I mean, I think most, I recognize most of the participants, but for those who haven't been able to tune into the past couple of webinars, don't know what Earthworks does, um, we use OGI or optical gas imaging cameras. So these are the exact same cameras that um, the industry uses, regulators use to detect pollution leaks in their case, but pollution at oil and gas facilities. Um, and when we're talking about this pollution, we're talking very specifically um, about methane and VOCs, volatile organic compounds. These are pollutants that are um, invisible to the naked eye, but we can see them with this technology. So that is what Earthworks does. That's what we've been doing around Longmont. Um, and so on the next couple of slides, I'm going to share the visuals show you what's coming off of the night pad that you're not seeing with your naked eye. So let me, so this is um, from September 3rd. So a couple of weeks ago now, um, on the left-hand side of the screen is a digital camera photo. So the naked eye view of the pad, you can see the sound wall up and all of these photos and videos that I'm gonna share are from um, this resident that Mitzi, Mitzi mentioned, this home that's about 600 feet away from this pad. So digital camera, naked eye view on the left, on the right hand side, you have an animated GIF showing um, what we see, what I see when I look through the OGI camera. And 
On the third, you can see this, um, this is, these pollutants are probably from combusted sources, just given the characteristic of that plume. Um, on the left-hand side, you can actually see maybe a little bit of it. If you look really closely, there's some visible opaque emissions coming off from behind the sound wall. Um, so probably generators or engines that are running during the fracking process. But in the GIF, you can see as it pans up, as it tracks up, um, a lot of these um, emissions are not being burned off. There's a lot of uncombusted emissions that are coming off of this pad. Um, this is on the 9th, so just about a week later, September 9th. Again, naked eye view on the left, on the right-hand side, animated GIF. This was much more significant of an event, much, much more pollution. You can see this just massive plume that's coming out from behind the sound wall. When we're filming fracking pads, it can be hard to identify the source, obviously, because of the sound walls up. I'm not really sure, personally, um, what this uh, plume, where the source was. This doesn't seem to me like it's the same um, from what we saw in the last slide. It seems like more of a release of some kind. Um, don't really know. I'm going to be probably following up with APCD now that this video is ready to be shared with them um, because this was a very concerning um, plume. And, and as you can see, as the camera tracks up, it just takes up the entire view of the camera as it is going up into the atmosphere. And again, important to recognize the fact that this is not just off in a field somewhere. There are homes literally surrounding this pad. The reservoir is, uh, you know, just to the south of this pad. Um, so these pollutants are, um, have an immediate health concern as well as the climate, larger climate concern. And then finally, um, one last uh, visual of the night pad. This is from just the next day after that last video was uh, filmed. And again, you can see, um, Pretty dramatic, uh, pretty dramatic imagery. Um, this, this again is probably similar to the September 3rd from combusted sources from generators running on the site. Um, but you can see just how much of that pollution is not being combusted, how much of it is still entering into the atmosphere that we can track with the OGI camera. And then I have one last visual I want to share. And this is maybe a kind of a disheartening note to end on, but I think it's sort of a reality check as to where we're at and I think how far we still need to go. Um, so this is actually not in anywhere near Longmont. This is in Broomfield, Colorado, and this is from 2019. So this is the last time um, in 2019, Earthworks was filming a lot of new fracking pads that were going in in Broomfield and Erie. It was kind of the last time there was a lot of um, fracking in the front range. And then COVID came around, things slowed down a bit. There was the rulemakings last year. And now things have picked up again um, this year with the night pad and with quite a few other pads up and down the I-25 corridor. And the reason I'm sharing this is as a point of comparison, if you look at the visuals that we were filming in 2019, um, I personally don't see a whole lot of difference between these visuals and the visuals that I've been filming at the night pad. In fact, in some ways, I'd say some of the stuff that I filmed at the night pad is kind of worse than some of the stuff we were seeing in 2019. And I point this out not to discourage all of us, but to, again, provide a sort of reality check. I mean, we just went through this marathon rulemaking process at the COGCC, at the AQCC. The intent of these new rules that were adopted this year was to mitigate the harm from this um, industry, mitigate the harm to the health, to climate. And we've made some significant progress. The new rules that were adopted are definitely a step in the right direction. Um, but again, you know, we can see, I'll just go back a slide. We're, you know, on the ground, the reality is not enough has changed. This industry is still extraordinarily harmful, extraordinarily impactful, and we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so with that, I think I will stop my um, sharing and hand it off to the next speakers. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really interesting and very enlightening. And thank you for all the work that you do. I really appreciate it. Uh, we put this up. Uh, we put this next in the agenda because we're going to go now to locally. And we're going to listen to our local representatives. Uh, Marta Lochman is our Boulder County Commissioner representing District 2, and so uh, you're up next, and uh, in this panel is going to be uh, Susie Hidalgo Faring, the Longmont City Councilwoman from Ward 3. So first is Marta. Go ahead, Marta. All right. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Good evening, everybody. My name is Martha Luchman, Boulder County Commissioner, District 2. I live here in Longmont and represent, of course, our other 330,000 residents. Um, here in Boulder County. And I am going to see if I can 
share my screen. We did it successfully a bit ago. So I'm gonna just hope for the best here. And it looks like I've got capabilities. So if someone can just let me know if it's up and you can see the slideshow. Looks, good. looks okay. good. I've got a couple different screens here doing different things. Thank you for that. So um, just pleased to be here and thanks for inviting the, the county commissioners to participate in this conversation. We talk about local action. This is, a really, um, this is a really critical one for Boulder County. And I will just share, because it's not in the slide and I don't wanna forget that we did uh, bring on a new policy analyst to the Boulder County Commissioner's Office this year, since January 12th, when both Commissioner Levy and I um, joined the board. And so that is a really exciting step. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means for us from a uh, local, uh, action and work that we're going to be able to do. So we'll go through a few of the slides and I'm going to try and get in the chat at the same time and share some of the links as well. So this is just some information about Boulder County involvement in the in the rulemaking itself. And let me see here, this is... So just to give you an idea, oops, hang on, because I've got notes on one computer and then showing differently on a different screen, of course. Um, that's what I get for trying to respond to a message at the same time a few minutes ago. Yeah, and you can put take uh, after you're done uh, speaking, you can go ahead and put the links on after that. You don't have to have them right now. We'll get them. We'll get them at the end of the of the event and we'll put them all out then. So. Oh, yeah, no, that's that's great. Thank you. That's not the that's not the issue, but thank you. All right, so this one is just our the um, history on the rulemaking piece, so that we will just want to talk about a little bit and share. And I won't read through the slides um, word for word because you'll have them, and of course we can always forward this over there too. But obviously, Boulder County is actively involved in a number of state actions and pushing for some of the increased pieces that. We just heard about from some of our legislators. Um, we are working on local government coalition. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the CC4CA um, and that was some of the work started in Boulder County. So we'll get a chance to a little bit of a deeper dive in county's oil and gas action as well here, just related to air quality and climate. But these are a couple of the pieces that, that you can see on the screen that talk about CDOT, Transportation and Transportation Commission, uh, currently involved in the rulemaking process, addressing uh, greenhouse gases from the transportation sector that somebody talked a little bit about some of the, the legislation that they're working on um, in that area of moving from biodiesel, I think uh, Representative McCormick was talking about and some of those other pieces as well. So we'll, um, and then ozone we'll talk about here in a, in a minute as well. Boulder County Air Monitoring Study, and I heard somebody talk about um, uh, uh, Dr. Dutlev as well in just from a timing and a standpoint. So for those of you who don't know, and I think in a lot of times these conversations are to the choir and to folks who are really involved, but in the in the optimism and the, the enthusiasm that we might have new folks participating or learning or getting involved in Boulder County, maybe some new residents and new neighbors uh, who aren't uh, as active in the past and may not know the history. I think it's helpful for folks to know that some of this monitoring study began in 2017. So it's work that Boulder County has been really involved in. And the commissioners uh, just recently in the last two weeks uh, signed some new and updated funding in that contract that, that really is connected with the work of Boulder Air. That is funded with the Boulder County sustainability tax. So obviously our voters are also working on the same, these same issues as well. There's a few links that are mentioned there. Um, and I would just encourage folks to use bouldercounty.org as a resource. Some of the work that I've been doing just as a new commissioner in general from an internal piece is really working with all of our departments to figure out where we can be a little bit more inviting, a little bit more resource friendly, a little bit more multimedia, et cetera. So, and we're seeing those updates uh, throughout our website in different departments. So I would encourage you again to use that as a resource. Partnering with Colorado State University and analyzing data, really similar, right? And that goes back into that same history. So same pieces that a lot of you are talking about as far as the VOCs and the research, the data, those pictures that, that Andrew just shared were 
we should all be alarmed. I think it is a really good reminder that the work needs to continue, that we need to be vigilant, that we need to be sharing this information out and, and uh, letting folks who aren't aware and who aren't part of this conversation, who aren't here tonight digitally or watching online, how do we get to, to, to our neighbors and, and share this information? So um, messaging to the public in that same regard. We are, these are some of the, the different pieces and we'll ju I'll just show you a few of the, um, the messaging that is being shared to inform and provide actions because that's a little bit, right? Educate, how do we motivate? How do we get people who might be interested and so that they can use it in their own op-eds, that they can use it in social media um, and, and, and move it around. So there's a couple of different just examples of the messaging, like I said, that we're trying to include some different forms and different ways to get people interested and involved and connected uh, in the public. As you know, um, ozone action is so critical right now because of where we are. Someone already talked a little bit about climate change and as someone talked about really where we are as far as the weather and what that's doing for our summer ozone season. Um, someone shared a little bit of data already. Unfortunately, we experienced a record setting summer this year, which all of us know with 75 action alerts so far and the warm weather obviously is not over. We're still experiencing that. The Denver Metro North Front range area has not met the EPA's national ambient air quality standards for ozone for too many years. And, and we know that, and Colorado is now working on the new plans to meet federal requirements under the Clean Air Act. And Boulder County is really involved in that work and will continue to do that. So again, adding our new policy analysts that can focus on this um, is really helpful. And we will be able to not just focal on, focus on local regs and local um, policy, but also do more state and also national with her expertise and, and that addition to our team. So that will be um, really exciting for us as we start working on those types of policies now, getting prepped for 2022, like our legislators who are already sharing this evening. Boulder County is actively involved in this process to, to push for tighter controls in those different areas. Ozone Action Day alerts the same piece. So we're working on those same social media um, opportunities too to get folks involved and just give some other places to share. New County Oil and Gas Regulations. So this is obviously folks on this call are, are familiar with SB 19181. Uh, and for us in the, the commissioner's office, we receive emails and calls, which everybody is welcome to send an email to commissioners at bouldercounty.org with any pieces of you know, information or wanting to just check in on, on, hey, is this county, is this city, where is, where is this? What are you all doing? Have you sent a letter? We get a lot of those types of requests and it's helpful because every once in a while there'll be a policy or some a piece that we haven't yet weighed in on. Um, we can bring our policy team to, to that, their attention to give us some, some advisement and do some research. This one, certainly um, Article 12 is one of those that we get questions on. Uh, quite frequently. So there's just a, a, a quick piece in there as far as what the other piece that we've been working on is around the fines for leaks and failure to find or repair them and did lobbying with our team and, and us as commissioners to um, the session that folks were talking about. Boulder County efforts at the COGCC in 2020, we participated heavily in the mission change, which was a redraft of almost the entire set of regulations. And these changes included increased emissions controls and monitoring throughout all stages of development, along with enhanced authority and roles for local government. This year, we're involved in the financial assurances, rulemaking that indirectly includes greater regulation of pollution and emissions through financial controls. The OGCC has increased it's inspection staff and procedure, but we believe there's always room for more resources to expand on pollution prevention and control. And there'll be a, uh, you know, just this piece, residents can help, residents can work together uh, and we're continuing to do uh, that work as, as um, in collaborating with and supporting our legislators as well. Some of these other efforts, uh, Boulder County has been involved in many stakeholder groups and rulemakings. We have testified and I, I got an opportunity to testify um, this session with the AQCC to tighten controls on the oil and gas industry and we'll continue to do that. There's um, 
a link in there. If people want to jot it down, otherwise they can throw it in the chat. Um, or I think Lynette said she could send it out. Uh, most of you may be yeah. familiar with the CDPHE and that particular comment period. Um, and so we'll touch on a little bit about county climate litigation. I think that's that's some of the most calls we get are about what you know what's happening right now. Someone already mentioned Suncor, um, and the county is a plaintiff in a lawsuit against Suncor and Exxon, demanding that they pay for the anticipated costs the county will face for re reacting to climate change impacts. And this this case is still in its early stages, but there's a little bit of information about that. I'm sure some of you know the history about it, but I won't read that full slide to you. Reporting health concerns, we've been getting a lot of calls about this um, in, and this is just a good, again, kind of informing and educating folks when we talk about all things climate. Um, there was an oil spill, I'm sure y'all are aware of just maybe three months ago or earlier this summer. Uh, and, and we got a lot of calls immediately about who is that, who takes care of it, who can we call in public health with responded to find out where that was and what land it really was on, what was the cleanup gonna be, et cetera. So there's a couple of those um, websites, phone numbers, that type of contact information, because again, folks need the information, need the education, need to be informed because those of us that are here right now, we're here because we care about the climate because we don't have to be convinced that we are out of time. We don't have to be convinced that we need bold action. We don't have to be convinced um, that that all of us as legislators and local folks and, and representatives and and me, our, our nation national leaders we all have to be working together who's missing are the folks that aren't here in this call who don't have this zoom link um, who wouldn't have been invited to the school building or wherever these meetings typically are held um, just from participating over the last few years and so that's our task that's the opportunity we all have is to share this information with those who who don't know and who aren't aware and who've never seen those videos that that Andrew shared with us tonight because those are the images that will hopefully get our um, other community members involved in all the different ways that everybody shared about tonight. So thank you so much. And I did um, share with Lynette that I am leading the community engagement for the American Rescue Plan Act and our $63.3 million that the Boulder County will be receiving. That money is specifically to address COVID impacted sectors of our community. And I know there's folks um, participating that would like to give their input and would like to share where they would like those funds to be spent. So I will put that in the chat as well and, and encourage folks to get online at bouldercountysurvey.com. It's a quick survey, it's five minutes. It's our initial phase of this project and this process. And you can just get, you can see the YouTube if you missed the bilingual virtual town hall that we had two weeks ago to share about that information. Again, that's really, really important resource for the 43 folks that are on tonight and the people that are watched later. That's an opportunity when we talk about how do we get financial relief. And that's just one of the buckets of funding that's coming from the American Rescue Plan Act. And there separately will be infrastructure money when we talk about climate and the different connections people have already talked about um, tonight. How do we use those funds in a way that are really gonna create equitable outcomes for everybody? So thank you thank for the you. invitation. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming and thanks for all you do. If you could stop your sharing. Oh, good, you got it, okay. All right, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all you do. Next up is Susie Hidalgo Firing, Longmont City Councilwoman from Ward 3. Hello. Good evening. Um, Good evening. So I do have some slides that I'm going to share, and it, it won't be much. I know we're we're running we're, out. Of we're okay. We're okay. okay so go ahead. We're doing good. I saw the 7:30, and I started panicking. Yeah. But no, we're okay. Oh, good. So let me put this. Okay. And so, whoops. Let's see. Come on. There we go. And then let me put it at present. Oh. It's an interesting view. Hold on, let me move this out of the way. And here we go. So um, hopefully you all can see the slides. Um, so this is just some of the highlights of what, um, what the city of Longmont has been engaged with, what we're, um, what we're working on in addressing um, just climate um, 
actions, but all you know, cl um, community behavior. So just things that that the community can do um, as a whole to, to kind of change to change habits, um, and so and how we as a city can best best support those. Um, so you can look at um, what we're doing in the EV, the transportation, energy, water, um, adaptation, resilience, waste, and economic vitality. So I'll, you know we can. I don't need to read read all of those, but you can you can look at those. And so you know I kind of want to go back uh, looking at the waste part. The green skull. Green Star Schools, that, that is primarily with what the school district is doing. Um, I know my school, Indian Peaks Elementary, is a Green Star School. And um, so we, we connect with, with um, the Green Star program the, and the county, but looking as a city, how we can, can help support, facilitate, and get more schools, schools on board. So really it is a, a community community effort, a group effort of multiple organizations coming together to, to address these issues. And, um, you know, make, and making the transition from gas vehicles to, to more um, gas efficient or, or ideally EVs. And so opening up the opportunities for people to get more, um, more access to um, charge, charging stations and what have you. And uh, let me go on to, and some of the things I had talked to with um, some of our folks from um, the Longmont Downtown Authority and um, the economic, um, the economic development partnership that we have in Longmont is looking at ways that we can help support businesses who do use um, clean, clean energy or re more renewable energy in their businesses. You know, we, we have all these opportunities for, for businesses who are starting up to get receive incentives. So let's start tapping into those um, practices in, um, or in businesses that, that utilize those, um, that utilize more um, renewable energy in their, within their, their businesses. Um, and so this was from a slide that we received yesterday during our council, our budget report and kind of looking at what we're doing citywide and what our goals are for next for next year and put the money that we're putting into continuing our air quality monitoring, looking at transportation, energy, uh, waste diversion, and um, and even with with the um, and looking at community too. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know, we look at the um, economic factors, socioeconomic status within our community and ensuring that that our lower income have access to the same, um, you know, the same opportunities to use renewable um, energy within and composting in their um, in their daily lives. So um, and then I'm going to move this on. Um, and so something I do want to share is, you know, we do have two stations with the um, Longmont air quality um, testing our um, data collection sites, just like as um, uh, Martha, our Commissioner um, Lochamine, Martha Lochamine had commented earlier, the uh, what Boulder Reservoir is doing. You know, we're looking at what um, we have two sites here in Longmont that are um, checking the air quality. Uh, one thing in our last, it was in the August meeting, we saw that. Um, that the air pollutants, they are going down as of last year based on those, um, based on the um, air quality update that we received. Um, so between the summer of 2020 to 2021, they, they were a little lower at Union Reservoir. Um, there were some anomalies and some spikes over at um, the airport uh, it, it was it was interesting to to see and you know really I try, wanting to identify you know one of my my goals is looking at some of these anomalies where they're coming from um, something I found that was really fascinating in um, in a, 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 a presentation that I heard from Dr. Helmig was how geologically where we sit in Boulder in Longmont in Boulder County is we're kind of in this spot where where this pollutants and, and um, poor air quality just kind of fester or they come and sit over, over our area. And so it was, 
so even if we it, within our city decide to, you know, we cut out these all these um, vehicles that create these um, these very toxic transmissions in the air, emissions in the air, we still are, you know, experiencing the um, the outcomes and the um, downfalls of what's happening in Weld County and other parts, you know, further out east because that air just kind of comes and sits over over us. And so I do watch very closely. I have a son, a uh, special needs son with um, asthma. And when the air quality is bad, we, you know, you, you can definitely feel it. it emergency room visits and it, it, asthma, you know, flare ups. So we do, we do look um, carefully at the, um, what the Boulder Air is, um, what his work is reporting that data, as well as um, I have an app on my phone. I'm sure a lot of you do, but it's that um, air quality, um, the Air Now app, where I'm able to check and see what the air quality is to, to kind of, you know, he'll prep before he goes, maybe check his nebulizer before he goes out um, when the air quality is pretty, pretty bad. Um, and then the other thing that um, we have through the city, and I just wanted to, to share a, a little screenshot of what, what it looks like from, um, from people visiting the website and what you can do to search, um, to go to the city website, site, search the air quality, and you can find links to reports, presentations, and other, other resources. And um, so let me move on to there. And oops, trying to get out of that. There we go. And I'll go ahead and stop my sharing. Oh, here we go. There we go. And um, and so aside from that, other um, you know other things that I'm working on. So I sit on the RCAB, the Boulder County Resource um, Advisory um, Conservation Advisory um, Board, and we're really looking. We're taking a deep delve in looking at equity and ensuring that other members of our community have, uh, you know, who typically aren't engaged in, um, in recycling, composting, taking, making um, those um, efforts and, and who, who don't, who lack the opportunities to engage in those efforts to, to reduce our um, greenhouse emissions. Uh, we're, we're working together to, um, to build um, a, um, an equity subcommittee and we're reaching out with other uh, folks who sit on the board. We are, um, so, so we just kind of got that work kicked off and kind of addressing what are some of the obstacles, challenges, what are some things you need from, from our subcommittee to, to help bring this, this work forward. Um, you know, we look at um, in, environmental justice factors that would ensure that people who are typically um, vulnerable to you know, people with health conditions who are vulnerable to um, to poor air quality, you know, to make sure that they they have the resources and the access to um, one to make a change and two to be able to identify you know when the air is bad, how to monitor, and how to be an active and um, engaged citizen uh, in their in their own communities. Um, one of the, you know, looking at, and I think I feel like I'm, I don't want to reiterate, but so much of what I was wanting to say was already kind of mentioned throughout. But um, as far as, you know, what you can do, um, and I'm coming from, you know, I, I sit on my, um, my teacher's union board, and we do a lot of um, community engagement or member engagement, and how to, you know, reaching out to our elected officials. And, you know, a lot of times what I've seen in emails is you know these cop copy and paste and then you know sending these these email messages to our elected officials and now seeing it from the elected official side you know I'll, I'll look at one or two emails and it was like oh okay that's but then after you know four or five of the same I think it it, it I've kind of oh well I've already heard that um, one of the things that we we have often done in our um, union and advocacy for um, public education is, you know, taking that, okay, what are the bills that are going to need to pass? What are our demands? We tie it in with what are, what we're experiencing, what are the, um, the, the impacts of that? 
And, um, and then we kind of, we go into our demands, but really personalizing that. Um, I think, you know, what folks are doing and coming forward to council, sharing your experiences, sharing, you know, what, what you are asking of us as elected officials to do. I think that that just continuing to, to voice those concerns is, is, is powerful. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage everyone to, to keep moving with that because there's, you know, we are, we're, it's no longer considered climate change. We are in a climate crisis and, and we have to do, um, we have to do so much more in order to, to address those things. But, um, but I, you know, I see with our city staff, with our um, members of council that we are committed through work that we're doing through our climate um, action task force and looking at improving energy efficiency, um, increasing renewable energy, um, you know, looking at um, increasing and putting funds into supporting vehicle electrification and making it possible for, for the average resident in our, in our um, community. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> good, information, good information. And thank you so much for all that you do on the city council. I'm so glad that you're on the council and um, it's just been great having you and I look forward to next year. Of course. And if there's anything you need from me or anything, you know, that you feel like, okay, Susie, you're missing the mark on this, you know, look into this, you know, send me that stuff. I'm, I'll, I'll put in my email in the chat because, you know, okay. teacher by day yeah. and I'm learning the ropes of elected officials. Yeah. Well, thank <laughs> you so much again. I really appreciate it. Sure, of course. Uh, next up on our panel are attorneys and they are going to talk about legal policy and community actions. And I don't know if you guys want to go one at a time, if you want to go back and forth and, and uh, talk to, talk together, but I'm going to introduce uh, Mike Foote. He was formerly a member of the Colorado State House of uh, Representatives of the 12th House District, and he's currently, currently an attorney in Lafayette, uh, especially specializing in climate change, and energy, and natural resource matters, utilizing his experience and perspective in, uh, in these kinds of agencies. So uh, Joe Salazar is formerly a member of the Colorado State House of Representatives, District uh, 31. He's an attorney and executive director of Colorado Rising. Uh, it's, it's a grassroots organization working to protect our health, safety, quality of life, and the future of our, uh, of our, of our earth. Um, so uh, I'm going to let you guys decide who wants to go first, uh, if you want to bounce off of each other, if, however you want to do it. Welcome, both of you. Uh, thanks, Lynette. I, I, um, Joe and I, I did a little paper, scissors, rock, and uh, came up with me going first, and then Joe will go second, I think. But uh, okay. I'll may just go back and forth as well, because um, we work together on a number of cases, Joe and I do um, litigation and, and otherwise. And so, you know, we might be able to kind of um, go back and forth or answer questions from that perspective. But, but I'll go first and just say a few things broadly, I think, and then turn it over to Joe and see where he wants to go um, after that. But so the, 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 the title of this seminar was simply, what can we do? And, um, you know, this is something that I've uh, committed to speaking at maybe three or four weeks ago, maybe longer at this point, I think. And I've been thinking about it kind of in the back of my mind ever since. And, you know, it should be a pretty easy question to answer. But in fact, for me, uh, at least from a former legislator, now a full-time attorney perspective, it's not quite as easy. Like, you know, as a legislator, um, I've been an attorney for eight, uh, for for 15 years. I was a legislator for eight years. Now I'm an attorney that, that I just do environmental work, uh, I you know, for the environment as opposed to for the polluter. And, um, you know, I, I found that being a legislator was a lot easier to answer that question about what you can do because, you know, I could look at a law and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Maybe we should change it. <laughs> and, you know, three quarters of the time, I think I was successful in that. So as an attorney and not a legislator, it's a lot harder to do that. We got to kind of play with the cards that were dealt. Um, it's a different story. But as a legislator, I, I had to jump on late, so I didn't hear what the uh, local legislators said, but I'm assuming they kind of said many of the same things that anybody would, which is get involved at the local level um, talk to your legislators, make sure you let them know uh, what you want to see. And really at the state level from the legislature, a lot of times what constituents say 
can actually become a bill that passes, um, which is the great thing about the state legislature. So that's great. Um, it's more complicated when it comes to just, you know, being an attorney and, and fighting in this area. But I'll talk a little bit about the COGCC and then a little bit about the um, Air Pollution Control Division and Air Quality Control Commission, um, because those are really the two main agencies, particularly the APCD and AQCC for air quality. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that and, and then hand it over to, to Joe. So, you know, the, the, the thing about legislation, and I know that people have talked about Senate Bill 181 already, but the thing about legislation is that when you're reforming an agency, a state agency in particular, a lot of times the legislation is just the beginning. Um, I mean, it's great to pass a big bill, and uh, certainly 181 was a big bill. It was a heavy lift. But then, you know, it's the agency's job to actually turn the, the act into action. And, um, and sometimes that's a lot easier said than done. Uh, the COGCC is like most agencies, you know, they're a big agency, um, although not as big as many in the state, but big enough. And change sometimes comes hard. So um, what, what we have seen, I think, um, particularly through the mission change rulemaking, was a pretty effective um, uh, citizen advocacy campaign. And, you know, I think during the actual mission change rulemaking, which I think Andrew kind of mentioned before when I just hopped on, was pretty epic. It went on for about nine months or so or something like that. Maybe it seemed like it was that long, but it was a long time. And um, uh, the industry was well represented as they always are through attorneys and experts and consultants and everybody else. Um, but with the mission change rulemaking, um, the community was represented well also. And I think that made a big difference. Um, there was community members that came forth either through organizations or themselves and participated. They told their stories about what it was like to live next to an oil and gas operation. And um, the commission ended up really falling on the side of the community, I think, you know, more often than not on some of the open questions, even though the industry was um, very powerful and argued and, and very well paid and all that uh, at that time. So that's, a, I think that's an example of how the community can make a difference in a concerted way. And, you know, rulemakings aren't done. There's still plenty of rulemakings to happen at the COGCC. There's the financial assurances bonding rulemaking that's happening now, or will be starting back up soon. They're going to take up cumulative impacts again, probably, I think, next year, which will be another good place to make a difference, either through an individual or through or an organization. Um, but then there's also just the straight implementation part of it. And this is kind of what I see as an attorney, where the industry, I think, is working the refs a lot better than the communities are. And part of that is because the industry is very well resourced. They have lots of um, people and attorneys that this is what they do all day as they kind of hang out at the commission and try to figure out where they can talk to folks and, and you know, like I said, kind of work the refs a little bit. And also because, you know, what the industry does is they, uh, they work their permits through the staff um, pretty much 95% of the way before they're even submitted. So, you know, by the time the public even gets a hold of the permits, it's already about 95% baked through the staff. And so, this is an area where I think the communities can actually make a big difference by participating in that process. You know, it's kind of like the process before the process. So I just put it out there to kind of just give an idea of what I'm seeing as, as a weakness and in, in the environmental interests in the communities and can get into more detail later, I guess, about how to specifically do that, or you can get in touch later and I can give you more details of what I might have in mind. But I, I just wanted to put that out there to flag it for folks and and we're really getting to the point now where the commission is actually approving um, new permits, like new location permits. They just approved the first couple of them just, uh, I think, earlier this month. And we're kind of getting into the meat of what mission change is really going to look like. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. And, you know, it's like I kind of look at environmental interests um, compared to the oil and gas industry. It is a little bit the David versus the Goliath, but, you know, David can win. The other way I kind of look at it is that movie Moneyball, which maybe some of you have seen where, you know, the general manager of the Oakland A's, which has hardly any money, can still stack up against the New York Yankees, which has all the money in the world, by doing it better. And I think that we need to kind of look at it from that angle, too, where we're never going to have the same kind of resources, but we can work together, collaborate, share information, and I think we can do it better and still make a difference under what the mission change rules are 
and what 181 allows. So one thing I'll mention also of specific interest to Longmont is the Cub Creek operation, the night pad. Um, I took a look at it and there, from what I can see in the data, there's been uh, nine complaints filed with the CRGCC, almost all about noise since the beginning of August. None of those complaints have actually been addressed at this point in time. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and, and actually they should be addressed, you know, right, right away, but now they're not even being addressed at all as far as, as far as I can tell. So one very specific action item that you can take forth from this presentation is um, the next time that there's a commission meeting, which would be next Wednesday, you can sign up to speak and say, look, this is how this is actually affecting us and letting the commissioners know straight up as a community member, as a citizen, this is what's happening to us right now. We've got complaints that are in front of your, your people and they're not doing anything. And if there's a few people that say that, what I've seen is the commissioners actually will kind of mention it and at, at least ask the staff to follow up. So it becomes something that's kind of at the top of the to you list. I've seen that several times. I can't guarantee any outcomes, but at the very least, it'll be a lot better than huh, doing nothing, which is kind of what's happening right now. So I would encourage that as just kind of an immediate action item there. Um, and also just letting them know how miserable it is and how bad it is in order for them to keep in mind, you know, basically don't ever do this again. Um, this was something that was kind of a legacy before 181, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the more the commissioners know about the effects and the bad effects, I think the better, particularly when it comes to your, your very specific um, experiences. I mean, ultimately, from a legal perspective, there could be ways where, you know, you file a lawsuit to tell them to follow the law, that there's actually a couple of lawsuits filed right now that have been consolidated that's telling the Air Pollution Control Vision to follow the law by the Wild Earth Guardians and EDF. Um, so that's always a possibility, but as Joe will probably confirm, you know, litigation is a very uncertain game and um, you never really quite know where the judge is gonna come out and, and uh, you can't really put all your eggs in that basket, I don't think. Okay, so I'll move on very quickly and then turn it over to Joe to the Air Pollution Control Division and AQCC. Um, so the AQCC, it, in my humble opinion, I think is deserving of something similar to Senate Bill 181. Um, they need some real systemic reform. I think um, uh, right now there's still a part-time commission, which is what the COGCC used to be. But the problem, there's good things and bad things about being a part-time commission. The, the bad part is, is that they're very staff driven. Um, and right now the staff that's driving them has issues, very big issues themselves. And we've seen reporting just, just uh, the last couple of days about that on Colorado Newsline. So, um, you know, the staff itself has issues and, and they're the ones that are driving the decisions at AQCC. So that's a problem and that's, that's gonna be, you know, I think has to be legislation based. So go back to your legislators and talk to them about that. But one thing that I will say is that with one bill that was passed this year, House Bill 1266, which was about environmental justice, it's, it, it really wrote in um, uh, environmental justice and uh, helping disproportionately impacted communities into the statute. Like there's actually a statutory duty now in Colorado statutes to quote, decrease environmental burdens that are suffered in, in disproportionately impacted communities. Now disproportionately impacted communities are defined in the bill, but they uh, roughly equal, I think, um, uh, either 40% communities of color, 40% um, under the 200% uh, of the federal um, poverty level, I think. So that's income. And there's also 40% housing challenge, meaning um, they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. So it could be any one of those three categories or all three. And as it turns out, if you calculate it, there's about 1.6 million in Coloradans that live in a disproportionately impacted community. So that's a lot. What that means is that I think there's an angle there for community activism to focus on, where you can really focus on making sure that the rules are even stronger in disproportionately impacted communities. And the CDPHE slash air Pollution Control Revision slash Air Quality Control Commission should have a very sympathetic ear based on the bill that was just passed this year, at least to put that into place. And then from there, assuming that you can get some tougher regulations in place, you might be able to move on to the rest of the state. But I would just say focus maybe first on disproportionately impacted communities, which are more widespread than you may assume, just based on the, based on the state criteria. So um, I guess I'll leave it there. 
I might have gone longer than I should have, but that's what happens when you win paper, scissors, rock, and uh, I'll turn it over to Joe, and then I guess we can go from there. Thank you so much. That was great. Great. All right. That's good to see. Hello, Lynette. Um, it's great to see everyone. Uh, always happy to defer to, uh, to my buddy, Mike Foote. Um, so he covered an awful lot of things. I, I, wanna, I wanna cover some of the things that you can do right now. And I see that we have some legislators and some county commissioners and, and also a, a, a city council member on, on the line right now. And um, this is basically to you and to your constituents. Um, the city of Longmont, um, Boulder County and the state of Colorado have massive amounts of land. Uh, it's land that's not being used. It's land that, you know, that uh, city council members or, or, or county officials uh, or the state are looking to develop. And um, we don't have the water resources to develop these things by handing it over to developers and just letting them build housing and, and, and bringing in more people. We just don't have those resources now. And so what I would suggest is that um, in order to address the issue of air quality is that uh, maybe you as government officials should start looking at planting regenerative crops and carbon sequestering crops such as hemp. Uh, hemp is a product that can be sold. It is a, uh, it is a, a, a commodity uh, that could be sold on the market. In fact, I know farmers and ranchers are sorry, farmers here in the state of Colorado who are making an awful lot of money by planting hemp. Why wouldn't you use your property to do that in order to generate some, some income for, uh, for your local government, but also to help sequester carbon in the environment? I don't know if you know this, but hemp is actually a great, I mean, it just, it pulls carbon out of the air and it, and it puts it right back into the ground. And it also takes pollutants too, out of the air and puts it back into the ground. So why wouldn't you do that? That's one thing that I would suggest. The other thing that I would suggest is that the legislature should start looking at legislation that um, that creates strict liability for oil and gas operators whose oil and gas um, activities uh, has caused harm to the public or has caused harm to an individual or to the property. I, I ran that bill in 2014, so it's not as if it's a new thing. Uh, it was called the earthquake bill, but it was more than just earthquakes. It was about creating strict liability on the oil and gas industry. When you create strict liability, you shift the burden of proof to oil and gas to prove that their operations didn't cause the harm. Right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing these lawsuits from Boulder and from other municipalities, local governments across the, uh, across the United States, as well as individuals trying to sue the oil and gas industry um, for causing harm, environmental harm, which then leads to you know uh, harm to infrastructure and to, and to individuals and the property, but the legislature has the power to create shifting burdens. So why wouldn't you create a burden um, to the oil and gas industry where they have to prove that their activity isn't causing the harm? The science is already out there. When I ran my bill on, the, on, on earthquakes as well as other harms, the science was, it was starting to become settled, but it wasn't completely settled. Now it is, right? Here we are uh, nearly eight years later and the science has settled on this, that the oil and gas industry is causing climate change, which is resulting in harm to, to, to people and to property and to local government's infrastructure. So that's one of the things that I would suggest that legislators do. And I think that it's incumbent upon you to have to do it. I mean, you were elected in this time in a climate crisis for a reason. And that reason is, is that you have to meet the burden of your time. And the burden of your time is to ensure that people can start fighting for themselves and start fighting for their properties. And local governments can start recouping uh, the massive amounts of dollars that are being lost as a result of the climate crisis. So shift that burden. You have the power to do that as a legislator. Um, Mike is right. It's not easy to sue. And it's not easy to sue because when you sue the oil and gas industry, you typically have the burden of proof. We know this, right? Uh, we have multiple cases going on right now where we have the burden of proof. We have motions to dismiss filed against us all the time or motions for summary judgment. We're representing our Longmont on the, on the, uh, on the fracking ban, trying to revive that fracking ban. 
And, you know, that case was dismissed by the district court on summary judgment, even though that there were genuine issues of, of, of material fact in dispute, and still the judge uh, granted um, the COGCC and COGA their motion for summary judgment. And now we are up on, um, now we're up in front of the Colorado Court of Appeals on this issue. We have other cases where we're representing uh, the Ivy, uh, the Ivy folks, the ACDAN folks here in Thornton, where we're trying to stop force pulling, uh, saying that it's unconstitutional uh, based off of our own state constitution. I'm working on that case with Mike Foote now. And it's not easy. I mean, we have had some decisions come down that have been a little bit shocking. But when you're working up against nearly 100 years of court precedents in favor of the oil and gas industry, it's going to take some time to move this ship around. And that's where the legislature can actually be helpful. If you can provide some relief to litigants where they don't have to prove that oil and gas is causing the harm, but that oil and gas has to prove that it's not causing the harm, that is a huge step forward. I'll tell you something, if you don't do this now, someone's gonna do it two years from now, four years from now, five years from now, they're gonna have to do it. So step up, be the champion that you say that you are and actually run this legislation. And with that, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna stop and, and have anybody ask any questions. I'll need, I need to let you know that talking about air quality, we're using our air fryer to make some chicken wings and the air quality in my house is pretty is pretty uh, smoky, so you might hear the uh, fire alarm go off. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. That was great. I'm so glad to have you here and to uh, talk talk to us about that. It was good, good on good on you. Um, yeah, let's have let's open it up to questions and answer. Michael and uh, Judith will will um, look over the questions. I guess I have, we're kind of uh, long, we're kind of a little bit over our time, but I just wanna say there's a couple of events coming up uh, Friday. There's a world climate um, event and it's, I, I can't remember the name of it, but I have it on the last slide here. Um, but uh, it, we're going to get involved here in Longmont, 6th and Main, three to, five, three to six on Friday. I think it's called, well, I'll, I'll it, it's it's up here, so you'll see it, and I'll send it to you too. And then also on uh, City Council Tuesday, the twenty eighth at seven p.m., they're going to um, they're going. We, we're asking you to support the Energy Innovation Act. Let's see if I can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, if you're interested, you can RSVP Moria uh, this Longmont CCL Climate at, at gmail.com. The Longmont CCL at climate.com, or if you can attend, you can email the council members to indicate that you support the city council endorsing the Energy Innovation Act. Um, and then I don't know if anybody else has any announcements. It might be one other thing, but go ahead with the questions and answer. Okay, uh, this is Judith. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I'm repeating a question from the chat room. And this is basically for Marta, if she's still on the line. But uh, the question has to do with the fact that uh, our health researchers, medical researchers have pretty well concluded that there's probably no safe way to do fracking for oil and gas that, that isn't dangerous one way or another, especially toward health. And that the legislature had already come up with Senate with uh, the bill 19181 that allowed local control a little more power than had been the case earlier. So lots of speakers spoke up to the to the Boulder commissioners asking them to try reinforcing what Longmont started requesting a ban to be legal in Boulder County to to activate 181 and to challenge the whole establishment. Why was Long, why was Boulder County reluctant to try that having done lots of litigation that did lots of delays but didn't result in a in a in a complete ban. So that's a question. What was the why was the county commission so reluctant to take a risk? 
Judith, and Mara just left. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we can't. And if anybody that. else wants to say anything about that, uh, you know, you're sh sure welcome to speak out. If any, there's any of the other uh, speakers want to comment on that, we'll we will send that to her. She says, uh, any further questions, uh, let us know. Uh, okay. Well. We have several more, so I'll give Michael a turn to ask the next question and I'll come back. I don't, you know, Judith, I'm not seeing what you're seeing somehow because I don't see any other questions. So you got, but I did actually, I had a question of Martha, who ironically or coincidentally has, has left, but maybe somebody can answer this, particularly Mike or maybe Joe. Um, it was she mentioned or in a slide uh, mentioned that Boulder County has made efforts to uh, to require further financial assurance, financial controls. These were words she used, and I'm not quite precisely clear about what she meant other than what I've always thought was missing. And that is huge uh, requirements for uh errors and omissions or liability coverage. Uh, and that has seemed to be neglected in this whole formula uh, over the years. And I can't figure that out. So why, why that's not pursued um, aggressively? I can well, take a stab okay. at that if you want. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, you know, clearly I can't speak on behalf of the Boulder County Commission, but um, you know, I, I do some work with local governments and on, um, on the oil and gas front and although not with Boulder County, so I can't talk about their deliberations at all. But um, so my to answer your immediate question about financial assurances and, and uh, those things that there are actually um, uh, the state itself, I think you heard is going through a rulemaking to change theirs, but the county in the meantime put in more stringent financial assurance requirements in the county code which does include insurance requirements. And so the county has done that. Mm -hmm. Looking at the county's regulations as a whole, it clearly, as you all know, it does not ban oil and gas drilling. Mm -hmm. the take on it is it's gonna make it pretty difficult uh, to drill in Boulder County. Um, they have to go through more hoops than anywhere else with maybe the exception of Broomfield. Mm -hmm. And even if they go through those hoops, there's still plenty of discretion within the county commissioner's hands to say no. Um, and so it's not an outright ban, but I also think that it uses 181 um, in, in a way to make it so, you know, it, it would set it up so that that they could say no and, and, and deny drilling permits. Now, if we were talking about other counties, like even leaving Well County out of it, but if you're talking about other counties, it the regulations are more about in a check a box and as long as you check all the boxes they say yes and i don't read boulder county's regulations like that fortunately enough for us to live here but it isn't an outright ban i of course agree with you on that and no one's disputing that so i'm not sure if that's answering the questions that were put up there mm -hmm. what i had to offer for it thank you thank you i'd like to say too that there, there is discussion and concern about abandoned wells and, and that the bonding requirements for abandoned wells is, um, is a potential real liability for the state. And so uh, there are discussions about that. Tracy, the, um, move, retrospectively, I presume that there weren't uh, uh, stiff requirements uh, as far as the uh, bonding on when those wells were made that would extend to the point of uh, closing those wells and abandoning them. So would that only, if there were changes made, it would presumably only apply to future wells, correct? Current and future wells? Can be retroactive. I, I, I had to ask Mike that question. <laughs> yeah, it can actually be retroactive um, oh. wells. So um, with bonding and then part of that is because oil and gas is, by the courts considered to be a highly regulated industry. And that's just part of the game. They know that new regulations can come about and they they would have to comply. And so the COGCC is going through that process now. And in their first draft of the rules, they laid out that the requirements that they want to put on the table would be retroactive. And they cited authority for it in 
And frankly, I don't think the oil and gas industry is disputing it. They're spending most of their time crying about how it's going to cost them so much to comply. So I think they're kind of assuming that it's going to be retroactive as well. You know, I got, I, I, I'd like to uh, chime in a little bit too, uh, especially with uh, Representative Burnett being on the line. You know, we, we've been filing uh, core requests after core requests against the Oil and Gas Commission to find out where these dollars are coming from. Um, you know, Texas T, when uh, they were chased out of Colorado, they had like $78,000 in bonds for to cover 10 wells, which isn't nearly enough to, uh, to cover those wells. Um, when uh, Petro shares went out of business, they had like $368,000 in bonds to cover uh, like a, a huge amount of wells, which would end up being like $7,600 per well, which we know is not enough. So we started asking the question, where's the rest of the money coming from in order to uh, address these, these abandoned and orphaned wells? Obviously, it's going to have to be state money. There's not enough that's being brought in through, uh, through fees uh, through the oil and gas uh, industry um, to cover all these orphan and abandoned wells. The other thing that we've been asking is, well, how many are there? There are 60,000 wells in the state of Colorado. How many are orphaned and abandoned right now? And from the number that we're getting, it looks like it's anywhere between 17,000 and 20,000. But here's the thing, oil and gas in, uh, commission can't tell us precisely because they haven't been tracking it, right? <laughs> There's a whole lot of incompetence happening over at the COGCC that we're finding out through our, um, through our core request. So then that leaves the question, with so many orphan and abandoned wells out there and not enough bond to cover it, then that's going to have to be on the state of Colorado, but you can't do that. If you are using taxpayers' dollars to pay to plug orphan and abandoned wells, you're going to run into a Tabor problem. Because Tabor prohibits um, multi-year obligations, meaning that you can't use taxpayer dollars year after year after year to pay for someone else's obligations. That ca those cases are being litigated right now. And that's what gives us the gravitas to tell the oil and gas industry that in order, or tells the, the, uh, the commission that rulemaking needs to be a full cost bonding uh, experiment. It needs to happen full cost bonding here in the state of Colorado. You as, as, as legislators, you need to show up to these hearings to hear what's actually happening. Um, you have that right to do that. That's the checks and balances of government. You get to check the executive to making sure that, uh, that they're implementing uh, the statute correctly. And I would, I would highly suggest that you show up uh, to, to rulemaking as it starts off in November all the way through, uh, through February. All right. Good. Good. Thank we you. Somebody has their hand up. Uh, Councilwoman Joan Peck wants to say something. So uh, go ahead and unmute, Joan. Go ahead. Okay. There and you go. Of, and some of his, did, did you hear anything I said? No, no. go ahead and start now. Okay. I was on a meeting a couple of uh, weeks ago with Ken Buck and some some elected officials from uh, from Weld County as well as from Adams County, and it was this exact subject about abandoned wells. So Adams County, I guess, just has hundreds of them, uh, and they are really overwhelmed with how they are going to close these wells. Some of them are so old that the operating companies don't exist anymore, as Joe Salazar has uh, mentioned. So I was wondering on a legislative level, is there any way to decrease to the oil and gas uh, organizations, companies, the amount of tax incentives that we give them so that we get more tax from, from this industry in order to be able to close some of these wells um, or get more royalties from them I, I don't know the ins and outs is how this would work or even if it would specifically to earmark those dollars to close wells because um, I think they should have to pay for it. But how can we make them pay for it in a way that won't hurt or involve Tabor or uh, maybe make it a grant program through the state that each county or, or city would have to apply for a grant through these funds to close their wells. Just a thought, I'm trying to think outside the box 
so that we can uh, actually hurt the oil and gas industry and help us. So, well, just think I, just, yeah. I just have to say that um, these are discussions that my colleagues and I are having. And uh, it's something that we are all aware of that, um, and I'd have to say, uh, you know, we, why do we have these, why do we have these tax exemptions? Why do we have these, these um, you know, why do we have these tax exemptions for an industry that's so mature when what we're really trying to do is uh, transition to a clean uh, energy of the future? So uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I know that it is being discussed at the state legislature. That's as much as I can say right now. But thanks for, I, I do appreciate your, um, your comment. Yay, thank you. <clears throat> any, other, any other comments or questions right now? I got a question uh, personally from Tim, uh, which is an interesting question. I'm, I'm sorry, Marta isn't here to answer this, but he says, because air quality exacerbates COVID and oil and gas is a large part of causing poor air quality, is there a chance that air quality monitoring can be supported by rescue plan funds? Interesting question. I don't know if anybody, but Marta, Joe I Biden. guess that's a county. <laughs> Joe Biden has to answer that, President. The president. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I think the county could appeal for that, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Is Karen McCormick still here? No. No, she had to leave. Okay, I had a question for her. Maybe we're past our deadline here. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I tell you what, we're going to put together a, um, we're going to put together a little handout for you guys and uh, we'll send it out. The worldwide day of action is fri uh, hashtag Fridays for future. And the one, the, and the, we're participating this Friday, uh, 924 from three to six at six in Maine in Longmont. And we will, um, definitely get you uh, the, a copy of this video and we will get you a copy of our other two videos if you not like. This video is gonna be shown on the Longmont Public Media on September 29th. And, um, and I just really thank all of our uh, presenters. We really got a lot of good information. I, I've got several pages of, of notes here and um, I think we really found out, found out a lot. It was very informative and uh, we've got to stay active. We can't quit, we've got to, we've got to keep going and uh, we've got to keep keep active and we've got to get more people to get to uh, to uh, be active with us. So thank you so Lynette, much. Stay tuned. Lynette, can we announce National Drive Electric Week before? Oh yeah, go ahead. Mitzi. Mitzi, go ahead. On a, po on a positive note, um, mm -hmm. we are hosting Sustainable Resilient Lawmont, an EV fair, electric vehicle fair on Sunday, October 3rd from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. We have it at the Boulder Fairgrounds as part of National Drive Electric Week. And we have surpassed what we thought we were gonna do. We've had so much support, so many auto dealers, we'll have food trucks, entertainment. So it's free to the public, come out and see where we're going with EVs. And it's October the 3rd, thank you. We have EV cars, we have solar, uh, solar panels and power walls and uh, bicycles and what else? Trucks, uh, all kinds of uh, yeah. electric. Vehicles. Guest so speakers. Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, any other announcements that we want to make? We will we'll send all this out to you, though. And thank you again to all of our speakers. Uh, it's, it's really been great to hear from all of you and thank you for all that you do. You guys are all wonderful. We're so happy. We're so lucky to have you all. No wonder we're a, a way ahead of the game in, in the whole uh, nation. So it's because of you guys. So thank you. Any other comments? All right, you guys take care. And our next event probably is going to be on water. So stay tuned. We'll be back.